right. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is RDC ADAPT, the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data and Analytics Platform webinar series. This is our first professional uh, series webinar of the year, uh, 2022, uh, and really uh, kicking off with a next annual presentation from Quinten Health, a French company specialized in artificial intelligence. Uh, Quinten is going to show and discuss uh, their AI solutions and how they can help with rare disease drug development. Next. So um, as usual, um, we are going to have a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Please put all your questions in the chat box uh, and we will answer these at the end of the presentation with our panel. Um, make sure all the questions are addressed. Um, actually, it's gonna be in the QA, Q &A to receive the, the, the questions. Uh, this presentation will be recorded uh, and after our presentation. So it's really my pleasure today to introduce you to uh, our presenter, Billy Yamzal uh, from Quinton Health. Uh, as you know, France always brings us the best and brightest and uh, Billy has an outstanding career. Uh, he's really started with the bang with an award-winning PhD in Bayesian optimal design at L'Ecole Polytechnique in France. Over the past 20 years, Billy has developed numerous breakthroughs in quantitative and simulation-based methodologies to inform strategic decision-making in healthcare. Before joining as CEO for Quinton Health, Billy led the model-based drug development team at Novartis, and is an added several analytical and data science groups in multiple health ag agencies. Billy also acts as a data science and predictive modeling, modeling expert for public health authorities. Um, Billy is a true expert in the field of free world data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, and it's a pleasure to have him present for us today. Uh, we have one of his colleagues, Martin Mommel, who will also join us at the end of this webinar for the Q&A. Uh, Billy, um, it's your turn to shine. Thank you very much, and, and uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. I'm very glad and honored to speak uh, today uh, at this uh, webinar, and I'm going to speak about AI-powered real-world simulation for faster and value-based rare disease drug development. Next slide. So uh, actually, I'm insisting on, on faster and value-based because that's, um, that addresses a, a critical business, critical uh, and, and uh, healthcare critical issues on, on, on designing uh, drug, de drug development plans and trials. And really putting on the table the question on how disease-centric analytics could benefit uh, the clinical development specifically for rare diseases. And uh, um, I'm going to put three uh, main areas where it could benefit uh, massively. First, in accelerating uh, drug development by uh, optimizing endpoints or, or by better targeting population for to recruit faster the patients that would benefit for the treatment. Also, to de-risk uh, trials by uh, optimizing uh, uh, the, the design and quantifying the risk upfront. And, and, and of course, also to maximize the reward value attached to a given trial uh, using um, uh, predictive tools to ensure um, high value positioning and to ensure that we are targeting high value patients up front. Next slide. And maybe as a start, as a preliminary, a very quick refresher that may be a bit um, obvious for many of you, but just to make sure that everybody is on the same page regarding the distinction between RCT data coming from trial data, from randomized control trials, and real-world data coming uh, from care in general or for, from non-international international studies, such as from registries, from medical records, claims databases, or surveys, for example. Uh, of course, the, the difference is not only uh, in, in, uh, in terms of quality or robustness. It's also be, uh, about the fact that real-world data and RCT data are informing on very different aspects of disease and of, of drug effects. For example, um, real-world data would inform on 
long-term outcomes, risk or, or effect outcomes, inform on real-world population characteristics, on the drug use in given practice, on care pathways, and ultimately on, on, uh, on effectiveness, while of course RCT data are focusing in nature on the physiology, on, on selecting trial, selected trial endpoints, and, and of course informing uh, primarily the pharmacological effect. Next slide, please. So uh, just to also to illustrate this, um, and, and to maybe, maybe one step to go one step further in on the question what what would be the use cases to use real world data augmented by dedicated analytics and more specifically using AI and machine learning for clinical development in rare disease. So I will um, extend on one specific example in, uh, later on in the presentation, but just to give you a, a quick overview on typical real world use cases. Typically uh, in phase two or, or early phase three, or to prepare, to prepare phase three trials. So that could be around characterizing the unmet medical need by modeling the progression before and after initiation of standard of care. It can be for um, to better or earlier identification of, of patients using um, diagnosis alg algorithms. <clears throat> also to, to uh, be able to classify and profile uh, ph uh, phenotypes in terms of progression, in terms of response of the treatment, and ultimately to optimize also the positioning in real world uh, and, and, and design trials accordingly to ensure that um, the, the, the drug tested in a given trial will be uh, uh, meeting the, the, the target population in the real world and therefore will be prescribed, well used, and have ultimately an impact on, on, the, the, on the public health and, and on the patients. Next slide. So now, maybe a broad question: uh, uh, How easy is it to uh, to apply, you know, typical uh, RCT analytics or, or trial uh, data analytics to real world data for drug development? And very quickly, uh, uh, an, uh, an example, an illustration, I would say. So be reassured, I'm not going to here to re rehash again the COVID pandemics, but just to give you a, an illustration on, you know, on how applying bluntly RCT data analytics methodologies does not work uh, on, on real world data. Uh, and, and especially for, for uh, you know, when you need to generate uh, evidence on, on, uh, on uh, an effect, that's just showing the example of, of hydroxychloroquine, but there are many, of course, other examples. And, and it just highlighted how uh, important it is to, uh, you know, to, to, um, to, to have to, to give specific care and, and with using pharmaco AP method, methods that are dedicated to real world data and, and really ensure that this uh, specific care is, is, uh, is, uh, is used for data curation, but also for variables definition and ultimately for analyzing the data and generating insights from, from real world data. Next slide. Uh, so, just to finish on, on this example, on this COVID example, it has also demonstrated that the use and the need of advanced analytics, including predictive modeling, uh, using real world projections, uh, was, was also instrumental, especially for decision making uh, and for public health decision making. And it was even in the news, uh, on the TV. And it also highlighted uh, the need of more integrative approaches, going a little bit beyond uh, you know, one study, one research question, one study, and, and also promote, uh, it promoted somehow more integrative approach in terms of data, in terms of data and analytics, and, and also the, the value it, it brings to, to have this integrative approach through platformized uh, data access and, and analysis. Next slide. So starting now, continuing with, with one statement, um, that I will develop in, in the next um, slides of my, of my talk. Basically, real world value based drug development, as I would call it, typically relies and strongly relies on the robust ability to project long term benefit risk in real world care, and therefore capturing the key sources of heterogeneity. And here, heterogeneity is, is not only for patients or patients' response, but also uh, for, for care pathway and, and for how the the, the drugs will be used and impacting in the real world. 
So I'm speaking about disease-centric uh, approaches here. And, and indeed, disease-centric analytics require to move away a little bit from the trial-centric and the product-centric approaches that we typically use in drug development, going more towards um, disease-wide mindset and analytics. And I'm showing here an illustration of, of you know, how this mindset switch can be visualized uh, when you look uh, at longitudinal data and, and, and you know, the, the questions like what is time zero or, um, you know, um, what is the, um, uh, what, what are the patterns of progression are very different if you are looking at the disease-wide data versus at, you know, the trial uh, data. So the time matters a lot. And, and, and that's a, an important consideration that is illustrating, you know, how analytics will also differ massively when you are uh, using and leveraging from real-world data. Uh, this all allows you also to address different questions, of course. And, and you know, uh, it goes beyond comparing drug A versus drug B here. Here, you know, when you are, you are approaching uh, 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 drug development with disease-centric approaches, you are, you are also able to answer questions like when would be the best time to switch that would guide on your inclusion criteria ultimately, or um, how, how to compare not drug A versus drug B, but treatment sequence A versus treatment sequence B in the real world. And that will also help you or guide you to better design your, your, your trials. Next slide. <clears throat> yeah, as I said before, um, data of different nature can inform on different variables. And that's why that's also why we need to integrate different data sources. Here, just as an illustration, uh, you know, we can compare different RCT data and different types of real world data. And some may inform uh, better what drives progression or what drives long-term responses or what drive uh, uh, benefit risk, while others may more on the pharmacological effects on what drives the, the efficacy and and and, uh, and the response of a given treatment so of course ideally you 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 would want to combine all those different data sources into one analytical engine and that's basically the vision i wanted to share as a as a scientist but also as a data science company uh, we are working on on this integrative and integrated vision of building, building this disease-centric modeling and simulation platform to generate, optimize, and disseminate evidence. First, for, for R&D and, and, and pharma development, but it can also be, go beyond and be used for uh, precision care or for health policy making. Here, uh, as you see on the left, we are representing the various data sources and data inputs of different nature that could feed such disease uh, modeling platform. Uh, assuming that you would have a, a suite of analytical algorithms to, you know, to integrate those data sources, to analyze them and visualize them, and of course derive key insights in terms of, of, uh, of you know, uh, best re responders or, or fast progressors uh, uh, in, in an integrative way. The idea here is to, to build ultimately a virtual cohort simulator that will be um, based on two main pillars. First. Uh, the disease progression over time in real world from early onset of disease onwards, uh, uh, capturing the disease progression, the different profiles of progression of causal chain of progression, and also with different uh, uh, patient profiles in terms of progressions. And in parallel, also the, the a model of care pathway that would uh, uh, simulate jointly the, the, the care pathway, so the treatment sequence or the exposure patterns, with of course the effects associated to, uh, to the drugs uh, exposure. Ideally, so the idea here is, is to, uh, to build this integrative simulator to be able to, to generate virtual cohorts and therefore uh, test and compare what if scenarios, scenarios in terms of you know, um, using different treatment sequences or uh, uh, optimizing a, a, a trial uh, by projecting, you know, the, the, the value of a given drug into the real world and therefore not only optimizing a, a design, but also optimizing the label and the, and the documentation and the, the, the substantiation of why you should be indicated in, for, on this patient at this line of treatment, for example. So 
I'm speaking here about those real world disease modeling. Uh, and of course, it's, it's, this is not new. The concept of disease modeling in real world have been also tested and, and used and pioneered numerous times. Uh, to my knowledge, always in project mode, building ad hoc a model for on a given disease. For example, here in Alzheimer's disease within a, <clears throat> a public private partnership uh, uh, called Roadmap. It was an IMI uh, European uh, uh, program where the, the whole idea was to develop a standard, a reference disease model applicable in real world, so um, valid for <clears throat> real world projections that could allow for a uh, for a uh, uh, long term proje projection of uh, of of uh, real world patients over time. Now. <clears throat> Typically, those virtual cohort simulators have been used and were often uh, used to inform trial design, but also uh, to defend labels or to optimize positioning or differentiation of drugs in development. Uh, again, allowing not only to compare drugs versus, uh, uh, together, but also to compare sequences of treatments, to compare care, path care pathways, and to identify uh, or to, to, to personalize the, 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 the care pathways or the treatment sequences uh, according to the patient profiles and to the patient phenotypes. Next slide. <clears throat> now, how to implement in a scalable way uh, these uh, real world disease modeling approaches on rare disease and rare uh, and drug development in rare diseases? Uh, as you know, there is a typically high, very high heterogeneity in disease progression, uh, and and this combined with with sparse data typically uh, observed in in, uh, in in rare diseases, potentially also combined with with uh, competition on on some markets. So that results in very high risk trials. So here you definitely need to to to, in, to use more data, so to use real world data and to use dedicated analytics to de-risk trials. To make them possible sometimes, and to uh, basically optimize the the target and the way you uh, you uh, you design uh, or you target the populations. Uh, <clears throat> so, what I'm going to to use how I'm going to illustrate that is using a case study on how to de-risk a phase three program in a, in a rare diseases in a rare disease in a, in a rare lysosomal disease using the different trick approaches applied on real world data analytics and, and machine learning. As a pre preliminary, I will uh, also give a, a short refresher on, on the concept of enrichment, meaning uh, trial population enrichment um, using real world data. So obviously in, the, in an ideal world, you want to target to a study population that is meeting your inclusion criteria based on your, your early uh, research. Now, you know that very practically, the enrolled population will be different once you have done your trial. And also the target population, the <clears throat> ultimate target population that would be eligible uh, for your treatment is also typically larger. Now, on top of that, once your drug is on the market, the actual users in the real world will be also another population, including some population for, for which your drug is not, is not indicated for. Now, the, the idea of, of enrichment is really to, to leverage from real world data, from existing real world data, and using dedicated analytics to see how you could actually enrich uh, your enrolled population in order to first enhance uh, the generalizability of the results once you have uh, com uh, completed your trial, but also accelerate recruitment and especially accelerate recruitment of patients that would benefit most of your treatment during the trial. So resulting ideally in an increasing chance of success, but also massively, massively de-risking the, the trial, also the, 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 um, the label that, that you will uh, basically uh, defend ultimately as a, as, as a drug developer. This enrichment approaches, again, have been used and tested successfully a lot in chronic diseases. Uh, here an example in schizophrenia, again, from an IMI uh, project, the, the Gatesville project that was basically dedicated to uh, leverage from real world data in, in drug development. 
Here it was using standard biostats techniques only. But as you see, by enriching uh, uh, trial recruitment uh, with rural populations, it was uh, it was helping relaxing some of the inclusion criteria. And of course, you may lose slightly sometimes on on power, but you definitely gain uh, uh, and gain much in uh, in in research generalizability, but also in recruitment rates of high unmet high met, high unmet need patients, so the the high value patients that on which you expect a differentiation. Now we want to extend this to this rare disease uh, case uh, using uh, real world data and machine learning methods. So um, that's what we did in uh, in, in, in Fabry disease. Um, so in the, in the case I am presenting here, we, we typically present the, the, the typical steps leading to this enriched and de-risk trials uh, using uh, the combination of, of AI ML, disease modeling and real world data. So the first steps, uh, is based on leveraging from existing real world data that can describe you the, 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 the progression and the heterogeneity in progression uh, over time. So the first steps here is was aiming at characterizing this heterogeneity on disease progression using real world data and, and enabling us to, to profile typically fast and slow progressors based on observed biomarkers or based on other clinical conditions. So this, this uh, <clears throat> This helped uh, optimize the unmet needs and, and target population to focus on the trial, on, on the trial to design. So the second step, based on these insights, was to, to translate those, those, those insights uh, in terms of, of trial designs and in terms of trial characteristics, inclusion criteria, design parameters, namely by mapping real world variables and real world outcomes to the trial variables that you can measure during trials and to the trial endpoints to, to be defined. Also defining the metrics to use for this enrichment. What, how, what do you call a good enrichment, for example? Uh, here, in this case, we wanted to enhance representativeness of, in the real world of the trial populations. We wanted also to maximize the recruitment rates of patients in need. So where uh, typically uh, fast progressing patients where uh, uh, unmet needs was, was observed and where you would expect uh, uh, an impact of the drug in development. The first step was to design the trial, uh, to define the trial, the trial uh, design scenarios uh, and identify the levers on which you can play uh, to optimize the designs, also the different design parameters, inclusion criteria and points definition and so on. Ultimately to to be able to simulate trials and calculate probability of success for each of these scenarios and, and pick the, the, the best one. So some of the results uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the heterogeneity characterization have also been published uh, at the, um, the recent World Symposium on lysosomal rare disease. Next slide. So ultimately, one end product from, from this exercise is a, a trial simulator that can be used for optimal design and which with real world population and real world evidence. And, and, and this trial is used to calculate the chance of success and, and basically pick the best enrichment strategy and the best endpoints. Um, as a, as a, a side product, uh, gains in recruitment rates, projections, and in real, real world representativeness was also derived, but also uh, long term impact or long-term uh, effectiveness can also be derived from this is uh, this is wide um, uh, cohort simulator typically to not not only for designing trials but also to uh, to ascertain uh, decision making uh, around labels for example or around around uh, post-marketing studies that you, you would need to plan so it's of course beneficial for uh, regulatory discussions but also beyond that with HTAs, payers, and other public health uh, stakeholders. Now, moving on from these, um, again, project uh, approaches uh, to platform. Uh, and here, I, I wanted to, to, uh, to end my, my presentation with maybe uh, looking forward uh, proposals on how to integrate um, uh, those different data sources and to propose an integrative approach to transform drug development for rare diseases um, and to, uh, kind of platformize uh, what I was describing uh, 
uh, for this is modeling in, in project mode. Um, <clears throat> so next slide, yeah. So just maybe uh, as a start, uh, a few pros and cons, and and typically why would you need such a cohort simulators? This is cohort simulators, and why don't you build them? You know, just as you need um, and and when you need it. So of course. Um, you know, if, if you uh, if you look at the the project I was describing, if you look at the time of execution, it can be pretty long. It can be pretty uh, uncertain, uh, and and you need to compromise uh, if you do it. You know, uh, uh, on a case by case basis. So the time of model development is again is pretty, can be very decorrelated from the decision time. That's not what you want. So here, this. This uh, modeling uh, and simulation platforms would definitely accelerate evidence generation, and it it will also standardize the uh, the the quality, the, the quality standards that you use for data uh, data curation and also uh, for analytics. So really, that's uh, um, a, a game changing approach where also you want to empower the whole uh, research, not only of course, uh, drug research, but also academic research with uh, smarter trials and enable beyond the, the R&D, uh, enable precision and integrated care moving forward. Uh, how, uh, how to enable uh, this platformization of modeling and simulation and of cohort simulation? Um, well, first, by combining, as I was illustrating through the examples, combining advanced analytics including machine learning, but also real world data science, including advanced pharmacoepidemiology and Bayesian modeling that is a very powerful tool to in integrate data from different sources in order to manage also ultimately and uh, the uncertainty that is, uh, that is delivered from the, from the, uh, the, the simulators. Uh, of course, you would need to have uh, to be able to integrate new data to maintain such a simulator and, and you, what the way we envision that is also to push for coalition approaches, typically public private approaches, where also illustrated in examples in the IMI project example, where basically uh, you, uh, you, 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 you put together, especially uh, at the pre competitive stage, uh, data, know how, and, 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 uh, and insights uh, together. Uh, and, and put that into a reference simulator that could be that could serve multiple needs uh, for multiple stakeholders. Next slide. So that's again uh, the slide that I was uh, showing before. Next slide. Now, if you want to more to specify the, the engine, the analytical engine that is underlying this this, this simulation uh, uh, platform, of course, you would need a, a suite of algorithms that goes from subgroup identification, sequence mining. Uh, that is able to uh, to make predictions, so uh, predictive analytics, causal inference, and so on, to again enable this um, this uh, um, the the building of this the, the development of these cohort simulators addressing both disease progression and care pathway. Next slide. So I'm now uh, sharing uh, just a snapshot from the uh, the CPATH website um, that gives you an overview of of the uh, uh, this uh, DCA DAP platform for rare diseases. Um, I'm sure you are all familiar with it, uh, but as you see, uh, um, like part of the, uh, the proposed virtual cohort simulators I was talking about, the RDCA, RDCA DAP uh, is, is using an, uh, uh, a, large, um, a large breadth of, of data sources, so it's really serves really as a multi-data integrator and processor. And it allows, as you see on the, uh, on, the, on the right hand, it allows for connection to other researchers where typically our proposed disease simulator could fit and could be plugged. Uh, so that's a, a vision, a proposal to, to envision how we could articulate the, uh, the virtual cohort simulator into the uh, RDC ADAP uh, platform vision. Of course, not undermining that this integration work would require uh, massive, uh, massive, massive work, massive uh, investment. Uh, and and uh, but typically, the, the the slide highlights how our vision 
are aligning. Mo moving a little bit uh, further on, on how to platformize the approach. Uh, typically, you will need to identify disease by disease, uh, the, the, the real world data sourcing that is of course the heart of, of such uh, an approach. And you would require this data sourcing to be sort of uh, industrialized at the highest st quality standard. Uh, and I mean, the, the data standards, but also the data curation standard, the, uh, the, uh, the governance and, uh, and data privacy standards, and of course the analytical standards. Um, so um, typically the pillars that you would rely on here would be on existing data platforms that have proven to meet those standards. So I was uh, mentioning RDC at that before, but we could also envision other uh, other um, uh, high quality and, and, and best standards data platforms, real world data platforms such as Etion, with whom we are we are also partnering, on on which a uh, uh, a process uh, uh, to develop, validate, and use cohort simulators can be built. And my final slide uh, is just to uh, again uh, finalize this vision on how to manage now IP once you, you are building such simulators and how you are managing proprietary data also through some flexible versioning to address again all the needs uh, from the different stakeholders. So ultimately, once you have built a model structure and characterized the different patterns, the different subgroups and so on, you would like to, uh, to manage IP at different levels. So typically uh, you could start building a simulator uh, with openly accessible or IP-free IP data, uh, can be public data, uh, to, to derive a, a core model that could be public, that could be published and, and, uh, and can, could be uh, the basis of further development. So the next version could be a consortium data or a consortium version using consortium data from uh, public or private uh, partners. There you could, you could, you could you know, govern the use through this consortium, uh, consortium, uh, uh, those consortia that could um, be assembled and to build free competitive disease models, meaning all the uh, the um, the part of the models could be uh, used by all consortia members to uh, to address pre-competitive space uh, questions such as what is the standard of care or what is the what are the fast progressors or uh, what are the, what what are the unmet needs and so on. So all the uh, pre-competitive space that is that is not linked to a drug in development. Yet you would you would need also to consider a final. Uh, a version that could be more proprietary, uh, typically uh, to to serve industry sponsors that we are willing to uh, to uh, leverage from their RCT data or their proprietary data, and feed the uh, the consortium version into a, a new version that could account for their drug in development, and to allow them to project uh, this compound in the real world. To project benefit risk over time, to uh, to uh, to optimize posi positioning, and and, and basically uh, simulate benefit risk scenarios uh, in the long term in real world. So that's basically uh, an approach that we could consider, and we are working on to uh, to develop so we can basically address the different uh, needs from different stakeholders. I will just uh, end here and and. Uh, thank you all again, uh, everyone, for, for attending the, um, the presentation, and we'll be very happy to address the questions. Thank you, Billy, for this uh, impressive discussion. Uh, so uh, we are now moving to the Q&A part of this webinar. So uh, again, uh, we also have Martin Montmel. Uh, welcome, Martin, uh, joining from uh, Quinten uh, to discuss uh, your questions with us. Uh, we have Megan Kala, our scientific uh, quantitative scientific director at RDC ADAP, and Jeff Barrett, our director. Um, who wants to start? I can kick it off with a, a question that rolled in through the through the chat. 
Um, so this one's for the, the Quinton team. Um, how do you address causal inference within your engine? Yes. <clears throat> so indeed, that's that's a, a very important question. <clears throat> Uh, it may not. It may <clears throat> causal inference could be uh, could be addressed um, uh, not only by real, of course with real world data and sometimes it can sometimes it cannot be, but also with other uh, sources of data, um, more uh, clinical data or, or, or specific studies. Here, the idea is is um, is also to use specific uh, causal inference uh, approaches that are basically inferring on the causal chain. Uh, prior to build you know, a complex a complex models where uh, you may not uh, you may you know uh, capture a lot of um, of correlation or, or, or um, confounding uh, before you no know, investing too much in the in the statistics what we what we are investing first is on the structure of the model so inferring on the causal chain uh, on biomarkers on on uh, clinical events and on um, on real world outcomes that could uh, be uh, informed by the model, of course. As always, you may still have some key uh, key outcomes, key variables in the causal chain that you, you cannot inform because you, it's not in your data. So then you will have some um, some uh, can say potential uh, gap or potential confounding. That's typically where uh, medical expertise is heavily involved. I say medical is not only medical, but also a biological or physiological expertise is heavily involved uh, in the in the in the whole process of of uh, model development and validation, of course. Uh, so that's I think one perhaps the, the most complex uh, part of this the, the model structure. And thank you for, for pointing out at it. Thank you for that. So another another question: Did you have the opportunity to combine combine real life or real world data with randomized clinical trial data? Yes, yes. As I was as I was showing, you know, uh, the the idea is that all city data are informing different parameters uh, as opposed to real world data. For example, uh, the effect of age. On uh, you know on response may be well informed by by trial data while um, the time the time to switch or the uh, the effect of adherence may be more well better informed in, from real world data. So the idea when we speak about integrative simulators here is really to leverage from all data sources together that can inform different parts of the model. Now sometimes you may have multiple data sources informing same part of the model and there we are using bayesian inference bayesian updates of, of the data to uh, to combine to integrate the, the information from the, those different sources you know, just a question here um in all your experience when we talk about cures acceleration what do you think the timing benefit is on it i mean i know we're at an exploratory phase here but i think the gains are really potentially great but any yeah. any thoughts about what the savings could be? So, so you, you are speaking about trial uh, acceleration, or are you talking well, about the, the model development? Overall, I, I'm thinking even in terms of accelerating cures, I think that's one of the things that the whole rare disease community yeah. is, is just hungry for, is yeah. that how can yeah. we get new medicines to market quicker? Yeah. So in, in my experience, um, I have specific examples for rare diseases and also for uh, rare indications, you know, where it's very very difficult to recruit, so similar similar issues. Um, so we were able to to uh, to divide by up to two the the trial time, including recruitment time, including the, uh, accounting for for uh, better targeted patients, because you know as I was saying before, sometimes you you know by focusing on on high unmet patients or, or fast progressors, for example. Uh, you yes, you are reducing a little bit your your, your target population, and you may also re reduce your sample size still, but with uh, much higher potential to differentiate and to show effect if there is an effect, of course. So that's the idea here. And the compromise, the compromise. So the compromise is tested via simulations, and you, in order to make the best choice. And 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 at the end of the day, yes, it results in in a more focused patients, faster recruitment. And 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 uh, and uh, shorter trials ultimately. 
we have a question from Mark Gastengay about uh, the coupling of mechanistic quantitative understandings of disease and drug action. And just, yeah. just to add to this, I think even though uh, Billy and uh, the whole Quentin Health did a great job and is focused on the AI machine learning approach, we're completely agnostic to different model types. And the yeah. whole of the RDC DAP platform and on all the platforms that we're talking about is, is integrating the various approaches to use them to ensure credible solutions. So I think that's in the spirit of what we're trying to do here. And I'm sure you agree, Billy. I'm fully, I'm fully agreeing. I mean, uh, uh, mechanistic models are, are totally complementary to what I was uh, showing here. And actually they should be integrated in many, exam in many examples like uh, you know, uh, also in, in oncology uh, or rare, rare, um, uh, rare indications in oncology where mechanism, uh, informing the mechanism is, is, is key or more growth or other mechanisms that could be um, uh, incorporated in the whole approach. <clears throat> Maybe this, this question by John Birch about the uh, the cost associated and then the benefit uh, related to the missingness of certain longitudinal data types and, and records. And, uh, you know, are, is there an opportunity to kind of augment this with this approach as far as a gap filling exercise? Yes, uh, <clears throat> um, exactly. The, the whole philosophy here is to leverage from all the data you, you have access to. Uh, so, and moving a little bit away from, you know, trying to get the best, the deeper and longer data source that could answer all your question at once, uh, because sometimes it's possible, but often it's not, it's not. So the idea here is to leverage from, you know, maybe shorter, but deeper data sources versus much, uh, much longer and much, uh, uh, much more longitudinal data sources where you may have much less biomarkers or information, for example but you want to combine the two together and, and basically derive this virtual whole cohort simulators that can <clears throat> address multiple questions uh, uh, that, that, you, that you, you are raising in, in, your, in your research. So really that's, uh, that's a very efficient, very effective uh, supplements from um, or, comp or, or alternative to uh, you know, the ideal data source that is costly and hard to get and so on. So we have another uh, another technical question for the, the Quinn team. I understood that you inform your model, your platform with medical advises, I guess parameter parameterizing priors in your Bayesian models. Did you combine different expert priors? Uh, yes, yes, usually uh, and, and experts are different experts in nature as well, you know, different focus and different expertise. So, but even in, in uh, yeah, we, we, are, we definitely involve uh, multiple experts and also historical data because players also come from historical data. Uh, so um, um, that's, uh, that's the, the, um, the standard, the, the, the good standard, the good practice in, in, uh, in evidence synthesis to involve uh, multiple experts. Definitely. Maybe Jeff and Billy, you could discuss this, uh, uh, you know, of a potential collaboration with Quinten. Uh, Billy had these slides on IP, which which really is, a, is an important topic. So uh, yeah. maybe if you want to comment a little on that proposal, a vision, as everybody knows, of the CEDAP is a nonprofit and, you know, everything at CPATH is open source, right? We develop tools, they are open source, we publish our results. Currently, uh, are these all scientists on the platform? We are not preventing anybody from creating an IP when they have access to some of the data that we're able to share, but just wondering if you guys could expand a little on your vision and, you know, aspects of that. Yeah. 
I'm happy to, to, to give a start. So and maybe to enlarge a little bit on, on this consortium approach I was illustrating here. Uh, again, the, the philosophy is, is really to, um, to build those uh, public-private partnerships that are sustainable and that can uh, <clears throat> build those reference cohort simulators in a specific rare diseases, but also that can technically uh, enable and also legally uh, uh, IP-wise legally uh, enable the, uh, the incorporation of, of proprietary data for drugs in development. So that's the whole, the whole concept. <clears throat> um, um, so we, we, have, we are building a first, starting to build the first consortia here. And, and as I was also trying to, to envision and, and present that there would be a, a fantastic synergy with you know, the, uh, the assets and the vision of of, uh, of critical path and LTC ADAP, especially uh, on, on, on the way we could develop such models and on, on the way we could um, govern the, uh, the data, uh, the IP and the data privacy uh, moving forward. To, to, again, to, to build this, these sustainable approaches that could be uh, you know, uh, maintained over time, that could be used for different purposes and upgraded with more data, more public data or more consortia data or more proprietary data for, for industry sponsors, for example. Yeah, and just to add that, I think it's important for the entire ecosystem not to be building barriers where there shouldn't be. I think what I hear from everyone that we are engaging with is this desire to find a way. It's not with any purpose of setting hard, fast rules that we can't work together. I think the important thing is that we recognize the the issue as it currently exists for rare disease drug development. This whole platform was uh, envisioned uh, initially by FDA to be this conduit for collaboration and to drive solutions, but really to accelerate cures. So what I think our, our discussions with Quinn Health have all been focused in that direction. Can we use this combined approach as a way of accelerating cures for patients and also make sure that we are paying attention to the needs of different stakeholders. So we're not here to prevent people from making money. Uh, on the contrary, I think what we're seeking is a way to coexist in a productive manner so that we can really maintain that initial focus of driving cures quicker. And, and, and maybe to, to, to add on that, so also taking the, the patient's perspectives here uh, and the care perspective, um, so, Accelerating cure is, of course, it is a lot about you know smarter, shorter trials that are um, uh, effective and well well designed. Yes, but it's also uh, once the treatment is available on the market, it's also good prescription practices uh, that are fit for purpose that are not too late or not too early for for a given patient. So it's also uh, you know optimizing switching uh, patterns. So really all these insights that are drawn from RCTs and real world data and that could be in integrated in those uh, models, mo modeling and simulation platforms would be also very valuable also for to guide the medical practice ultimately and, and optimize, the, maximize the, the patient's benefits. Yeah, Billy, just to feed into that, I mean, I, I think quantifying the standard of care is something that we give lip service to it, but having a group such as yourself start on that process and create a quantitative baseline by which we can design better trials, seek to improve convenience sampling in a more informative way, and then also suggest new biomarkers, when, particularly when coupled with more mechanistic approaches. That's the frontier here. I think we can take one uh, final question. Uh, Martin, do, do you want to bring that up? Uh, sure, yeah. So with regards to Reza's question on disease heterogeneity, uh, how we handle that, there are several ways. The first one is to quantify that heterogeneity. A uh, concrete example for Fabry's disease is that you have a spectrum from classical to late onset disease. Uh, and one of the very early steps in our uh, modeling, uh, modeling was to cluster that, uh, the, the different patients according to their clinical presentations normalized by age so that we would know uh, which patients are more of the late onset versus classical phenotype. And uh, the second thing is that it's actually something that really feeds into our models because it's critically important to understand, for instance, the speed of progression. So it's something that was, that was actually used as an input 
to 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 deal uh, uh, with that with that differences across patients. But the the real trick analytically was really to to especially when we didn't have any kind of very specific labs data was to leverage also non-diseased uh, patients, which didn't have any clinical presentations, and to see how much that was precipitated by the rare, rare disease. So Fabry, for instance, has uh, uh, both kidney and, and cardiac uh, afflictions, and you want to distinguish that from normal aging. So leveraging control patients was also uh, critically important in that, in that exercise. Thank you, Martin. Um, I think we are reaching... Uh... I think we have answered more, um, all the questions. So uh, maybe uh, Jeff, uh, BD, uh, final words on the potential. I think uh, we uh, at uh, and CPAF, uh, we, we uh, really want our efforts to be uh, global. Uh, we have offices now in Europe uh, to facilitate, you know, global collabor collaboration, collaboration with Europe. So uh, just final words from you. Well, just first of all, thank you again very much for this opportunity uh, to share our experience and our vision forward. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to start implementing uh, and engaging with, uh, with you know, all the uh, this public and private stakeholders here uh, on specific rare diseases, uh, potentially pilots that we will start with uh, on, on these, uh, these consortium um, uh, models that uh, we have been presenting. Again, a very, um, uh, very warm thanks and uh, Looking forward again for the next uh, the next uh, next round of interactions. You know, I'll echo the same thing. I think this is a just a starting point of uh, more detailed collaboration to to find a way where this combined effort uh, means something to rare disease drug development. So this will be done in a very open, transparent manner. One of the reasons we do these webinars in the first place is to expose this concept to a broader community. We're certainly very focused on, on both sides of, of this relationship on making this work and uh, keeping patients in mind and at the forefront of what we're doing. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks again, uh, Billy and Martin, uh, for joining us today uh, for this webinar. I think, uh, uh, I think it was very, very interesting. So looking forward to uh, uh, continuing discussion with Quinten. Um, and so uh, thanks uh, to our attendees for joining us today. Uh, we may have a few unanswered questions, but we'll try to answer uh, to you uh, offline. Uh, our next RDC that webinar will be May 18th uh, as part of this uh, professional webinar series. Uh, we will have uh, Khaled El Emam from Replica Analytics uh, discuss and uh, talk about his work in synthetic data, uh, which is uh, one of the areas that the platform team is working on uh, with Khaled. Uh, so it's going to be uh, yet another webinar for you to attend. So I hope uh, you will uh, all join again. Um, um, all. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Okay.